If you hear a uh, beeping, like a jingle, it might be the dishwasher. And if you hear a barking, that might be the dog. So, sorry. The organizers asked me to share some thoughts about what it means as a researcher discovering a new kind of harm, and what it means to explain that harm to the world. And I got stuck on that word, discovering. It made me think of people I learned about in high school who discovered stuff. Magellan, Columbus, Cortez, famous discoverers of lands where people had been living for countless generations. And I thought about Bronislaw Malinowski, who wrote Argonauts of the Western Pacific, and is credited as one of the landmark figures of cultural anthropology. But aside from everything else we can critique about the content of his work, it came to light decades later that he seemed to despise the people he was writing about, as evidenced from his private journal entries. And anthropology as a field is built on thousands of texts where authors implicitly claimed kind of authority to speak for entire communities and cultures with a kind of condescending, authoritative demeanor. All this without much regard for their input into or reception of that kind of work. A kind of condescending language of speaking for the other permeates even this field that I was originally trained in, a field that generally tries to pride itself on listening to and learning from people. Okay, maybe this is obvious, but I've been thinking about the colonizing effect of describing someone else's harm. Discovering has all of these connotations for me that make scholarship about algorithmic harm feel at least potentially harmful and exploitative all itself. And what's most problematizing is I don't think discovering is the wrong word for this prompt. What does it mean as a researcher discovering a new kind of harm means asking what it is to listen to someone tell you about their life and their pain and to never really get it as someone who doesn't live in that world. And then to write about it, to talk about it, to use my own voice to talk about someone else's life. In some real sense, my words speaking over theirs. To me, to a large degree, discovering a new kind of harm and then explaining it to the world inherently at least risks denying the people being harmed the space to explain it themselves, to say it themselves, to use their own words. I realize this is more than a little reductive of the social context. I'm in conversation with a field that doesn't value the knowledge that I'm pointing to. A culture, let's just say in human-computer interaction or HCI, that has a history of sandboxing and partitioning people for the purpose of treating them as individual automata, devoid of culture or context, or sometimes as representative avatars of cultures, which is problematic all on its own. This is getting a little ethereal and airy. I dwell on this kind of a lot. The impropriety of my own voice as I talk about the harms other people experience makes me really uncomfortable. Every word feels like I'm stepping on someone else's. Every time I speak, it feels like I've stopped someone else from speaking. The discomfort of talking about something like YouTube demonetizing the videos of trans creators, talking about their journey and struggle of affirming their gender identities, is pretty significant. I don't truly understand any dimension of this harm that trans YouTubers experience. And the same can be said about the experience of anti-blackness in the United States and the criminal justice system, which I also talked about in the same paper of street-level algorithms in, at Kai in 2019. And so when I talked about those issues at Kai in 2019, I felt bad because it felt bad because it felt so inappropriate for my voice to fill the room on those subjects. That feeling never subsides or passes. I feel it even right now talking about the very act of discussing it, which is a little meta. I, I want to pause here to say that we're going to come out the other end. Please stick with me because at this point in drafting my thoughts, I realized this was pretty grim and it would be a really bad place to stop. We will work our way from here to a more productive place. Just please stay with me. I think it would be helpful for us to work through something many of us have experienced and hopefully have some memory of. The first thing I thought about when I started thinking about this prompt was COVID. I mean, obviously, right? But I was specifically thinking about what things were like at the beginning just a few years ago. I mean, I remember reading about people wiping down cans with sanitizing wipes before bringing them into their home. I remember people arguing about what kinds of masks or gaiters or bandanas people should use to be safe, or if masks were even enough. I know people who wore gloves when they went outside or carried around tubs of hand sanitizer that painfully dried out their hands by the end of every day. The point is, there was so much we didn't know, and while researchers quickly worked to figure out the contours of what we could and should do to be safe, we nervously tried to be careful about absolutely everything we did. People tried everything that they heard might be helpful. I don't know how clearly you remember that time, but being careful about everything was exhausting for me. It was like tensing every muscle of my body and trying to hold all of them in place, bracing for an impact from the moment I woke up to the moment I fell asleep. 
I still feel a bit of that when I go outside. It's not as bad, but when I get home, I feel my chest and shoulders soften a bit. Like I can finally relax a little as I take off my mask. I don't know if anyone else felt that way or feels that way now, but I do know that we were all afraid of the same thing, as little as we knew about it. As uncertain as things were, there was some kind of grim relief in knowing that other people were apprehensive about the same kinds of things. We understood what we were doing, and even if in retrospect it wasn't necessary to wipe our canned food down with Lysol, I get the impression that nobody chastises those people for it, because quite frankly, we were all doing something a little odd. I say all of this for two reasons. First, because I think that while some part of the pain obviously comes from the harm itself, part of the pain comes from the confusion and the exhaustion of trying to make sense of this new situation. Basic questions like, what is this and why is this happening, seem frustratingly out of reach. If I cut myself while I'm chopping food, I feel that pain, sure, but I know what caused that pain. I can identify it, I can name it, even think about measures I can take to help with the pain now and avoid it in the future. And as I talk with people about my fears and pain and stress, people understand. Two years ago, with COVID, I think hardly any of us had much sense of what we could do to mitigate this thing that was causing so much anxiety and pain and death and grief. Now, I want us to think about something closely related. Fairly early on in the pandemic, there were rumors of people recovering from COVID, but not recovering. They were in constant pain. They reported having lost the ability to focus or think for extended periods of time when they got sick and never regaining those cognitive abilities, like a fog they couldn't get out above. Breathing and walking and all sorts of everyday activities became impossible for them when they were sick, and things never really got better. It was another new kind of harm. But two years ago, doctors and other experts largely dismissed it. The most common narrative was that this was just COVID, but that some people would take longer than others to fully recover. Eventually, that narrative, that answer, changed into doctors saying that it's psychological or psychosomatic. It's been two years, and as the medical community comes to terms with the reality that Long COVID is real, a discovery that folks have been living with for years. Their experiences are sidelined, literally placed in the margins and footnotes of conversations about how mild COVID is and what mild even means. I don't really know what it must have been like to have had COVID early on, to not really be getting better, and in addition to all the pain and suffering that long COVID represented, to be dismissed and discarded and written off in the stories people told about COVID for years. The only stories people seemed to want to hear were those about hospitalizations and deaths and full recoveries. And even now, people don't seem to want to hear about the chronic pain and lifelong risks of diabetes and other conditions that seem to be associated with long COVID. I thought about COVID because it felt like the discovery of this new harm, literally a new virus, weighed on almost all of us in varying but relatable ways. And so my hope is that we're close enough to that pain that we can imagine if authorities, doctors, epidemiologists, politicians, conference organizers, told us that we were overreacting or being unreasonable or asking for too many accommodations, or even flatly denying the existence of the thing that is haunting us, to know that it's real, to know that it threatens us, and them for that matter, or to have long COVID and to try to show people the evidence of the pain, all of the evidence that we have to bring to bear on this looming cloud, and to be looked at like we're ridiculous, to be asked to be quiet or to leave, and then to be quickly forgotten, collapsed into the margins of papers and notes, if, if we're even lucky. I don't think that being in a position of power or privilege necessarily makes it impossible to be an advocate about a subject, but I think it prompts a question I need to keep asking myself. What purpose are my words serving? In my work, I'm always trying to do two things. First, I'm trying to recognize a pattern in varying different contexts that might not be obvious to people living in the midst of a single one of those contexts. I think identifying the underlying shared futures of people targeted for harm and excluded from resources can help make sense of the overarching oppressive force and help nurture a sense of solidarity toward resisting that force. And second, I'm trying to show people in my field how much they lose, how much of the world they'll never understand, or if they're lucky, how much time they'll waste, ignoring the histories and lives of people, ignoring the continuous, nuanced stories in favor of the discrete, computable ones. What it means to me to discover a new kind of harm is to work to earn someone's trust after they've spent a lifetime hearing, often from people like me, that what they're experiencing isn't real, or isn't as bad as they say, or is as bad as they say, but is necessary that they suffer for the rest of society to thrive and be happy. And what it means to explain that harm to people who don't think critically about tech is to struggle to show more than the moment of harm, to show that there's this deeper pattern, and to get them to acknowledge that there's a kind of knowledge out there that they can't necessarily compute or collect as quantitative or encodable data. Anyway, that's my hot take about what it means to uh, discover a new kind of harm and to explain that harm to the world. 
Um, hopefully we'll get to have a conversation about this. Thanks. Thank you to Data and Society for putting on this fantastically pertinent symposium on the social life of algorithmic harms. And thank you for asking me to contribute to it. I'm Margo Kaminsky, an Associate Professor of Law at Colorado Law School. And I'm going to address in this keynote the question of what it means to encounter a new kind of algorithmic harm and make it legible to others through the law. The three topics I'll be addressing today are as follows. First, what kinds of algorithmic harms are visible to the law, both existing and recently proposed? Second, what regulatory tools are being used to address these harms? And third, how do the choices of these regulatory tools affect the construction of algorithmic harms in the law? So first, the kinds of algorithmic harms that are visible to the law can be roughly organized into three goals of regulation. The first goal of regulation is to correct error and bias. I've called this the instrumental goal. The second goal is justificatory in nature. This goal asks algorithmic systems to explain their reasoning and or to be accountable to fair process and oversight, whatever those things mean. Justification is perhaps perplexing to engineers in particular because it is inherently legal in nature. Murray Hildebrand writes, of how the legality of justification is tied to basic principles of rule of law, where we ask that the law be the same, whether it's regard applied to me or to you or to anybody else for that matter. That is, when we ask for explanations of algorithmic decisions, we're not just asking what could I have changed to arrive at a different outcome, but we're asking the system developers to reveal a legally and socially valid logic and basis of reasoning. Alternatively, we're drawing on principles from administrative law to ask that there be oversight and accountability over the system as a whole to make sure that the subjects of algorithmic decisions feel like somebody who represents them or can speak on their behalf has input and can reassure them that the system is in fact justified and legitimate. The third set of goals are dignitary in nature. These roughly boil down to trying to make sure that algorithmic decision-making doesn't objectify individuals by allowing individuals to have participation or autonomy. Now, it's common to say that the United States is more concerned with instrumental issues, such as correcting error or bias, than with dignitary concerns. This, however, historically is not the case. We have a long tradition in the US of tying due process with privacy, starting with the US Department of Health, Education and Welfare or HUE report in 1973 on automated personal data systems. The report effectively concludes that people in giant databases shouldn't be objectified. We should give them participation rights so that they can co-determine the uses of their information even after they've shared it with other people. Similarly, Justificatory and dignitary goals of algorithmic regulation attempt to ensure that individuals can co-determine the, both the uses of their information and the harms. So our three goals of regulation are instrumental, dignitary, and justificatory. What regulatory tools are being used to address these harms? Here we see both some similarities between and a significant divide between the United States and the European Union. You can break down regulatory tools into two large buckets, individual rights and systemic regulation. Individual rights have long existed over personal data in almost every country but in the United States. In the US, these individual rights are much maligned as they've been linked to a historically ineffective system of regulation called notice and control. You may be familiar with this as the user of the internet, Notice and control effectively states that when you go onto a website and you fail to read its privacy policy, by staying on that website, you have consented to whatever it is the website has agreed to do with your data. Very limited control and practice indeed. However, a true data privacy law is built on various principles of individual participation, where individuals are supposed to receive notification of what's being done with their information, access to the information that an entity holds on them, 
and limited rights with regards to personal data, including the right to correct and the infamous right to delete. Not only does Europe have such data protection law, but various US states around the country have been enacting similar laws in recent years. Now we come to artificial intelligence or automated decision-making specific individual rights. The European Union has AI specific law that grants specific individual rights. The General Data Protection Regulation or GDPR has Article 22, which for solely automated decisions, otherwise referred to as AI decisions, affords individuals a right to contest or challenge the decision, a right to express their point of view, a right to human intervention, and a right to explanation of the decision. Elsewhere in the GDPR, individuals also have a right to meaningful information about the logic involved in a decision. And that right is inherently justificatory in nature. Most proposed US laws, because very few have been enacted on algorithmic decision-making, don't have these individual rights. California, in its amendment to its privacy law, has a mandate out to its new privacy regulator to come up with regulations about access to information about meaningful decisions, uh, meaningful information about the logic involved in algorithmic decisions, and regulations about a right to opt out of AI decisions. But there has been no proposal of a right to challenge AI decisions in the US. This is making us actually an international outlier in dealing with both justificatory and dignitary harms and affording individuals an opportunity to co-construct the meaning of algorithmic injury. We're seeing the right to contest pop up in other countries, including in Brazil and proposed in Canada. And we've seen it in transnational proposals, such as the list of principles at the OECD. So the other set of regulatory tools for addressing algorithmic harms is systemic in nature. It's derived in large part from risk regulation. These tools are often ex ante, though not always ex ante, meaning before the fact of the decision. And they include things like algorithmic impact assessments, which instruct the developers and users of AI to, before they use a system in the wild, assess it for risks and assess it for impacts on fundamental rights, and then potentially mitigate those risks before actually using it. This risk regulation approach also includes other tools, and it's much more prevalent in the United States than it is in the U European Union. However, when we look at the draft EU AI Act, which was recently proposed and largely modeled after product safety regulation, we see a similar risk regulation based approach. The big problem with this, with using risk regulation or systemic regulation, is that it doesn't have natural avenues for co-construction of algorithmic harms. That is concretely, there's no individual right of access or contestation for impacted individuals in the draft EUI Act. And there's no other way for impacted individuals or communities or stakeholders to get a say about the risk assessments of these systems. So this brings us to the third and final portion of my talk. How do these choices of regulatory tools affect the construction of algorithmic harms in the law? Well, largely individual rights allow individuals to participate in the construction of legal harms. Think of the lawsuit. You sue and you say, this person hurt me and here's how. And the judge or jury decide if you've been harmed and to what extent. If you have a right to challenge or contest an AI decision, you're similarly getting a chance to express your point of view about what, how the system has harmed you. With respect to systemic regulation, this co-construction is harder. Absent a system of notice and comment where you have input into the regulation itself, we're looking at things like asking impacted stakeholders to participate at the level of individual companies or consulting with stakeholders and their representatives at the level of government, ensuring data is coming from affected individuals or affected communities. See, for example, the impactful work of Ngozi Okadegbe on carceral versus community data. But I wonder too, whether we couldn't be more creative about this. And so I'm ending with a provocation. What else can we imagine about the shape of the ways in which we regulate AI and the ways in which that shape of regulation impacts our understanding and construction, legal construction of algorithmic harms. What could we compare these harms and risks to so as to be able to port in other more robust tools than impact assessments from other areas of risk regulation? That is, we've brought in impact assessments from the EPA's tools to regulate pollution. What about regulation of nuclear reactors or regulation of automated trains? 
If we're going to be delegating meaning making about algorithmic harms to say private companies or to government agencies, we need to figure out a way to get more input into and oversight over this construction, especially without overburdening already harmed and already overtaxed communities. Thank you. My name is Tawana Petty. I am a mother, organizer, author, poet, and lifelong Detroiter. I've been committed to leveraging art as visionary resistance for 15 years and to teaching anti-racism, digital, and data education for more than seven years. Thank you to Data and Society for having me. In 2016, Detroit City government and law enforcement rolled out a public-private mass surveillance partnership called Project Greenlight. It was promoted briefly to the public as bright green flashing lights that would be leveraged to deter crime in various ways. The lights themselves would be a signal to potential criminals that they were being watched, not only by the businesses they were attached to, but by law enforcement, 24 hours per day, seven days per week. Some law enforcement officers even have the cameras on their mobile devices and can watch them from the comfort of their homes, something we wouldn't discover until later. When the announcement about Project Greenlight was made by the former Detroit police chief, now Republican candidate for governor, I was knee deep into research with the R Data Bodies Project. As a co-lead at the time, I was responsible for coordinating conversations with Detroiters about the ways they have experienced data and digital systems. Detroit was one of three cities. The others were Charlotte and LA. During this research, we came across a dominant theme that community members wanted to be seen, not watched. This was a revelation for me as I began to learn just how insidious the proposed mass surveillance program for Detroit really was. Although it had been touted as a program that would cover only eight or nine gas stations that stayed open late, it became clear that a more sinister plan to make Detroit part of an ever-expanding police state was at play. We learned a year into the program that real-time tracking and surveillance of residents and those who visit Detroit was happening by Detroit police through facial recognition. Later, we would also learn that they were using cell phone tracking technology, shot spotter gun detection, surveillance traffic cameras, surveillance drones, and surveillance helicopters. I felt compelled to amplify the alarm that had already been sounded by co-liberators in the struggle against mass surveillance and the police state in other communities. I sought out to strengthen coalition efforts by convening community meetings, participating in town halls, and coordinating public responses at the Detroit Board of Police Commissioners meeting. Organizations like Greenlight Black Futures, the Detroit Community Technology Project, the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition, the Detroit Justice Center, and the James and Grace Lee Box Center were instrumental in this effort. And of course, there are many, many more not named. The Board of Police Commissioners is the civilian oversight body, which is supposed to be charged with overseeing the Detroit Police Department, but they have failed miserably. Not only was facial recognition voted on and approved by Detroit City Council right under their noses, but upon their discovery, and when given the opportunity to rid the city of this pervasive surveillance technology, they opted not to. Millions of dollars have since been poured into expanding these invasive systems, including adding additional real-time crime centers where the Detroit Police Department can monitor much of the city indefinitely. Despite massive public outcry in city meetings and on the streets, petitions and an effort to change the city's constitution through creating a Detroiters Bill of Rights, an effort I was very proud to participate in, 
law enforcement and city government have doubled down on surveillance and expanded their scope. Those eight or nine gas stations that were being monitored now include an additional over 700 businesses and over 2,000 cameras, which include public housing, laundromats, schools, medical facilities, and recreation centers. There's virtually nowhere in Detroit to go without being watched, unless, of course, you live in a wider, more affluent area of the predominantly Black city. And if you're unfortunate like me, you've also witnessed drones and surveillance helicopters outside the windows of your home. With the ever-expanding invasiveness of mass surveillance, it's easy to drift into paranoia. So much of Detroit, and increasingly the world, is beginning to feel like a panopticon. But something I learned from my comrades at Stop LAPD spying and through my work with our data bodies is that we must shift from paranoia to power. Detroiters have shown time and time again that we are resilient and able to make a way out of no way. It is my hope though, that someday we will no longer have to struggle against the conflation between surveillance and safety that we can get clear on what it means to be seen and not watched. It is also my hope that legislators will get more courageous before we are all living under a social credit system governed by algorithms and laws that prevent us from hiding our faces. And with that, I'd like to share a poem. I imagine a world where all who want to be seen are seen. A world where our dignity and humanity aren't wrapped up in machines. I imagine an earth preserved for all ages, a society not governed by artificial intelligence. I imagine consent integrated in systems and the data we share removable, revocable, and freely given. I imagine mass surveillance, a thing of the past, a world in consensus on face recognition bands, a world of technologists, researchers, and scientists asking, should this exist before unleashing violence? I imagine the radical revolution of values Dr. King proposed, the evil triplets abolished and order restored. I imagine survival alternatives becoming the norm extractive policies and laws rooted out and destroyed. I imagine abolition beyond imagination, a societal norm, a generational reckoning, a cleansing of spirit, a repair of past harms, an answer to injustice, a call to disarm. Every dehumanizing system, every practice in place, judging humans by gender, ability, economics, and race. I imagine co-liberation dispelling the myth that one hue can be exploited and others can be privileged. The world we exist in isn't fit for our spirits, but the one we create is if we are all committed. And some resources I'd like to share before ending are the Consentful Tech Curriculum, a toolkit for centering racial equity throughout data integration, the digital defense playbook, technologies for liberation toward abolitionist futures, Riverwise Magazine, and Data for Black Lives Data Capitalism Report. Thank you so much for your time.